can you hear me? Okay, the mic's on. Hello, um, I'm Molly Steenson. I'm a professor at Carnegie Mellon University. I have no slides. Are my slides here? Uh -huh. Hi, I'm a design professor at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, I'm a web geek for 25 years or more. Is that possible? 22 years or more? <laughs> and I have a PhD in architecture. And there's a reason I'm telling you this right now, because this all comes together in the talk I'm going to give to you today, um, which is coming out of my book that will come out next year called Architecting Interactivity. So I'm starting with a question. Where does interaction design come from? It kind of depends on who you ask. In fact, I think you could even ask, what does interaction design have to do with design? This might be a strange place to start a talk at an interaction design conference, but I think it's a lot more complicated than we think. And so in this talk, I want to look forward, or I want to look backward, in order to look ahead. I think that when we look at the history of interaction design, and we look at the origins of our discipline, of our practice, we're looking at something that didn't actually start as design. In fact, it had a contentious and contested relationship to design. It didn't always come from design. So we will look backward in order to look forward. I'm going to start with the early web. And this is ugly, and it gets personal, and it gets personally ugly. So if you need to look away, I understand. The early web had a lot to do with architecture. It also had a lot to do, in some ways, with artificial intelligence, as we're going to see, looking way back. And in this talk, we'll look at the foundations of interaction design. So back in June, when I was finishing my book, I asked on Facebook what people were doing in 1994 to 96 when they were designing for the web. Who here was working with the web in the very early days? Hands up? Yep. So I asked people, how did you learn this? And it turns out that there wasn't very much information about web design until about 1997. So I got 162 comments. This is the nerdiest Facebook ever. It's really good. I got, like, here's, here's some of it. Here we have Meg Horahan, who is the co-founder of Blogger, saying that she looked at view source. Here we have Howard Rheingold, internet virtual community pioneer, saying that he looked at view source and he asked Justin Hall. You know, view source, you click and you look and you saw the code for the page. And you'd copy and paste and steal things and try to do things that you thought were neat. And Jay Allen said it was view source all the way down. That's how we learned to design. But that's not how we usually think of design. In fact, when I interviewed a number of early web pioneers, they were interested in doing something very different from design, because design was window dressing. Design was graphic design. Design was interiors. Design was not serious and not functional, in their opinion. Some of you might have used the book by Laura LeMay, Teach Yourself HTML, in a week. Um, Laura wrote this book. This became a best-selling, um, the first really big best-seller technology book. You might have used the Netscape page. This is from August 1995. Um, and you probably went there to look up things and, and figure out what new extensions were possible. You might have used Project Cool, the cool site of the day, Glenn Davis. This is also from 1995. And that was what we had that passed as web design at that point in time. It was coolness, not necessarily good design, not necessarily thought out design. Okay, this is going to get personal and I feel like I should just... There was a maxim that just because you can doesn't mean you should. 
which is why my webpage looked like this in 1995. Yeah, yeah. Uh oh, I think I'm dead. My battery may be dead. Um, hold on a second. Ignore. Uh. Okay, is that, oh, that's much better. Okay, um, anyway, so we don't ever need to look at that ever again. Um, there were sites like word.com that did very innovative things, so I copied them. This is from my site about how to make pasta sauce. I ran a pop culture feminist webzine called Maxi in the late 90s, and this was something that we drew from in order, every time we, we launched a new issue of Maxi, we'd redesign the whole thing. This is before there was blogging, before there was content management, right? This was when my website went through a couple more iterations, pre-blogging, post-blogging. It begins to look better. Okay, you can look up now. It's, the bad part's done. But the point is that you look at this ugly web design and these, these sites that defied any kind of rational um, approach and you realize the problems that early information of architects were trying to, to, um, to address. So in the very first column that Lou Rosenfeld wrote for um, Web Review, his, uh, his column was called Web Architect, not Web Designer, Web Architect. And he wrote that web users face a number of problems, awkward designs, confusing navigational aids, documents covered by walls of blue links, and on and on and on. And he told his users, don't sacrifice functionality to aesthetics because after the feeling of love wears off, you are married to that website. And so where do you turn instead? You turn to architecture because function is more important than design, and design meant something very different. In fact, function was more important than design. So here we have the polar bear book, which many people are familiar with, and somewhere out here, I can't quite see him, is Jorge, who is one of the authors of the fourth edition. And in that book, Lou Rosenfeld talked about why it was necessary to turn to architecture as a way to figure out how to structure the web. He said, why so much talk about the impressions that physical structures make on us? Because they're familiar to us in ways that websites are not. Like websites, buildings have architectures that cause us to react. Buildings and their architectures therefore provide us with great opportunities to make analogies about websites and their architectures. So rather than looking to different kinds of communication design or industrial design, as people did later, early web designers turned to architecture first. Hmm. Seem to be having issues again with my clicker. So the question here is that architecture for the web ends up being bigger or more important or greater than design in some way. And by that I don't mean architecture like Zaha Hadid, for instance, with her conference center in Baku, Azerbaijan, that won the 2014 Gold Medal Award for the Royal Institute of British Architects. Zaha Hadid, who died um, just not very long ago, won the Pritzker Award for architecture in 2004. So not like Zaha Hadid's architecture. Also probably not like this architecture not really like the work of Elemental or Alejandro Aravena, Aravena um, who won this year's Pritzker Award, but a different kind of architecture, an architecture that was based on systems, and particularly architecture through two kinds of lenses, through the work of two people, 
Richard Saul Werman, and Christopher Alexander. These two architects who aren't mainstream architects at all, who don't build buildings that we're familiar with for the most part for their form, are the people who inspired early interaction design and web architects. So I'll talk a little bit about them now. I'll start with the term architecture of information. And we'll get to Richard Saul Werman, but I want to start with where it actually came from. The term is actually from Xerox. And in a talk that Peter McCullough gave when he announced Xerox Park, P-A-R-C, the Xerox um, Research Center, very famous research center, he said that the aim of Xerox was going to be to find the best means to bring order, greater order and discipline to inner information. He said that the fundamental thrust and common denominator of Xerox has evolved toward establishing leadership in what we call the architecture of information. This is in 1970. And he also pointed out that this was the advanced architecture of information technology. He has an idea of structure, of structure and communication and business and a way of, of, um, of setting up a new kind of approach to design into the world. And thinking of information as something that you could inhabit, that you could live within. This gets very important for us later on as we start becoming interaction designers and as we start developing the idea that information is something that we can live within and that users have a right to be comfortable within. So again, Richard Saul Werman did not invent the term information architecture, but he popularized it. And he did it a long time ago. This is a conference that I think nobody attended in this room. 1976, it was called An American City, the Architecture of Information. It was the big architecture annual convention for architects in the United States. Huge, huge deal. Buckminster Fuller, Buckminster Fuller gave the keynote. Jonas Salk, who invented the polio vaccine, gave a talk. There were talks about specking interfaces. There were talks about information management. There were talks about computer graphics. And it seems sort of like a conference you'd go to today. It's not, not unlike an IXDA conference. And maybe that shouldn't be a surprise because Richard Saul Werman is the person who would start TED conferences. So we see an early version of this here. And for Werman, information, he was, I should say that Werman is trained as an architect. He worked for Louis Kahn, Lou Kahn, the famous architect, for 13 years. He had his own architecture practice until 1974. And then he started viewing his architecture as architecting information, as organizing information and making it habitable, making it work with other people. Great, thank you. Um, and he did this through mapping, and he did this through categorization. And one thing, if you're familiar with Richard Saul Werman's work, he does the same thing. He follows the same themes all through his life. He's 81 years old now, and he's still following these themes and interests. So what he did in 1966, this atlas of American cities that was a feedback loop, he still put, he pursues this 20 years later when he's working on the access guides that perhaps you've used as, you, as you've traversed new cities or even tried to learn new concepts like Olympics or medicine or something else. He also looked at different ways to create types of information. The categorization that information architects do has Richard Saul Werman to thank for putting in place some of the practices, particularly in a magazine he published in 1989 for Design Quarterly titled Hats. And this is long before the web. This is even, he's not even thinking about it in terms of software, right? That's what happens when he publishes his 1996 book, Information Architects, and shows different ways 
that people in software and environments were beginning to think through information as a medium that you might move through or exist within. So the three things that Wurman did was structuring information as an architectural practice. Fighting information overload, I didn't include them, but his books Information Anxiety 1 and 2 were all about how to fight all of the information that people were trying to manage. And building community through the conferences that he's brought together. Not unlike what we do here today, and I think there's a debt of gratitude that we probably owe to Worman as a result. There's another architect who's very, very important. That's Christopher Alexander. Who here is familiar with Christopher Alexander already? So a number of you. Christopher Alexander was trained as a mathematician and an architect. He got a PhD in architecture from Harvard in 1966? 60, I should know this, 64. Um, and then he became an architecture professor. And I'll talk more about his work. But he was also one of the first architects to use a computer. And I think that what his work did was create an operating system for architecture that has been really vital for the development of software and for the development of the web and for the development of interaction design. So notes on the synthesis of form and a pattern language are the two books that he's best known for. Who's heard of a pattern language or at least of pattern languages? or design patterns. Yeah, I see more hands go up. This is where it comes from. So notes on the synthesis of form, and this is going to get a little nerdy for a second, um, was his dissertation. And his idea was that he wanted to find a way to take all of the requirements of a design problem, run them through a computer, and figure out the best way to put them together so that you could better define a way to solve a problem. And when you look at what inspired the book, it's cybernetics, it's mathematics, it's graph theory, it's gestalt psychology. And again, it all comes together as an operating system for architecture. So you see things like these charts that bring together all of the different kinds of requirements that you might have in a design problem. And um, he applied them to real world circumstances. So the BART system, the rapid transit system in San Francisco, California, um, also hired Christopher Alexander and his associates to create a list of requirements for the BART system. Find a way to best solve them and maybe design a system that would be better as a result. But the computer didn't work very well, and he discovered that it was really pretty inefficient. Um, oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so again, you start seeing very familiar tree diagrams, and he diagrammed all design problems as trees. So if you could put it a tr turn it into a tree, you could solve it. But he starts moving ahead toward pattern languages when he realizes that the computer wasn't doing what he needed it to do. He wanted to do something too complex than he was able to bring together. And so he published these two books many years later, 13 years later, to talk about a language that could help people to solve problems in the built environment. And what he said about patterns is that each pattern describes a problem which occurs over and over again in our environment, then describes, then describes the core of the solution to that problem in such a way that you can use this solution a million times over without ever doing it the same way twice. So this is what a typical pattern might look like. This one is for a row house. And in it, what you see is you see there's a title, there's a photo, there's a statement of the problem that he was trying to solve. There are descriptions and drawings of the problem. 
in a way that it would be possible to share it with someone else. That asterisk, that star, meant they felt very sure about this particular pattern. But some of them they included they didn't feel so sure about. So it's a network. All of these patterns, there are 253 of them. They go from the scale of the entire world down to the placement of a rug in the bedroom. And here you see a, a couple of um, the patterns just showing how the network works, the hierarchy, and the way they flow from one to the other. These are looking at cities. And he drew it, he also, um, around the same time, he published a book called The Timeless Way of Building. And The Timeless Way of Building was showing, was a philosophy for design, a new approach to design that opened things up, that tried to democratize things, and that introduced this idea of a network of patterns that you could share and work between as you designed whatever you needed to approach in your world. So what does this have to do with interaction design, you might be asking right now? Hey, Alan. <laughs> Hola. Hola. <laughs> so Alan Cooper plays, Alan Cooper is one of the people who found Christopher Alexander's work when he was in, I think, high school? Yeah, on his high school bookshelves in the library, found this book interesting and started looking at it, wondered what it might provide. And when I interviewed him for my book, and I don't think I've shown you this quote, so let's hope that I got the transcription right, was about the desire to be an architect, because you see, he wanted to be an architect. He really wanted to be an architect and says he would have been a terrible architect, at least of buildings. And that's just the point. So Alan said, the desire that makes these people want to be an architect is not satisfied by being an architect, in most cases, but is satisfied by being a software designer, an interaction designer, a software developer, a software engineer. This is where you get to do architecture, inside digital computers, and you don't get to do architecture out there in the built environment anymore. You approve? Oh, yeah. yeah. He said something else that I didn't put up here, which is that, <laughs> which is that he's someone who likes to take a chainsaw to things. The word was chainsaw. And to move in really big ways around ideas. And you can't do that with architecture, but you can with software. Other people around the same time found the patterns, found Alexander's work. This is Kent Beck and Ward Cunningham. Who here is familiar with either of these guys? Okay, so I'll introduce them. They were working as software engineers in the late 1980s, in 1987, when um, they decided to turn to the idea of patterns for software. They were trying to design an interface. And they suggested to a group of other programmers that maybe they should look at patterns as a way to bring together the knowledge in a design problem, to share it, to codify it, and to repeat it. And Kent Beck, when I interviewed him, said something really interesting about the patterns. What they represented was a rearrangement of the political power in the design and building process. So by moving into a situation where you have knowledge in patterns and other people can use those patterns, it's no longer the top-down kind of approach to design, where there are a couple of godly programmers and users out there in the world who just had to use whatever software was available. And this idea was really, really potent. Um, over a period of year years, until about 1994, when this book was published, a group called the Gang of Four, a group of software developers, came together to figure out how design patterns could work in software. They applied them to a lot of things that we all use every day. They applied them to object-oriented programming languages. In fact, that was the biggest, um, the biggest point of departure here. They applied them to design processes. Um, I suspect that a lot of people in this room use lean or agile 
programming or project management methods. Can I see hands? How many people use Lean? This is where it comes from. In fact, these guys are where are two of the people who worked on the original um, Lean and Agile manifestos. And these ideas come directly from Christopher Alexander. Christopher Alexander got so important to object-oriented programmers that they invited him to keynote their conference. And that's what this, is, this crazy picture is from. And he said they got it wrong because they misunderstood the moral imperative of patterns. He asked these programmers what they were going to do to make the world better, to make it more orderly, and suggested they had a moral imperative as builders of things because software was only going to become more important. So that's what Christopher Alexander brought. And we pick up the notion of patterns in our work in many, many ways. Um, I can think of the work of people like Christian Crumlish and Aaron Malone writing about design patterns, game patterns. If you do a search on Amazon for patterns, you will find about 1,200 books in English alone about patterns in software and in design. So that's how vital this is, and it comes from an architect who got angry at trying to use a computer and wrote a book of patterns for architecture. There's one other place where patterns come up. And that's not the Wikipedia page, but rather the wiki format. And Ward Cunningham, who I showed you a few slides ago, developed wiki, the wiki software, which is in use by Wikipedia now and which everybody uses every day um, around the world. He liked the idea of software being able to grow and extend without knowing where it was going to go. And this, again, is a, an application of Christopher Alexander's thinking. One other person to bring up is Terry Winograd, um, a professor at Stanford of computer science. He's now um, an emeritus professor, but still affiliated with the university. And he said something very important about software and design right around the time that the web was happening, which is this idea that we live within it that designers need to think not just of making interfaces and making software, but that they had to think of all of us as living within, inhabiting the space of software. And he said, software is not just a device with which the user interacts, it is also the generator of a space in which the user lives. Software design is like architecture. And I think it's safe to say that we do inhabit software, and we inhabit apps, and we inhabit spaces of design. And the design process is truly a political process. I think that's something that we heard in the talk right before mine, that this is political and this is difficult, and there are a lot of trade-offs. There's an importance in changing the politics of design and of using design to represent the user to design for living, which is something that Christopher Alexander came to represent, even though he's best known for his design theories and less so for his built architecture. But in this talk, I still said that I wanted to look backward, to look forward. And again, one of the, one of the slides that, um, that the previous speaker had just shown talked about the relationship of humans and computers, right? Something that a guy named J.C.R. Licklider in 1960 called man-computer symbiosis. Says, um, this particular paper that he wrote was the definition of interactivity for 25 years. In fact, today, when we talk about our relationships with machine learning, with artificial intelligence, we talk about symbiosis. This is an idea that has been around for 56 years. And he, he wrote, the hope is that in not too many years, human brains and computing machines will be coupled together very tightly, and that the resulting partnership will think as no human brain has ever thought before and process data in a way not approached by the information handling machines we know today. Still pretty contemporary. 
I add a human, I, I prefer to think of it as human computer symbiosis and not just man computer symbiosis. But this became also one of the first instantiations, one of the first ways that we talked about artificial intelligence. And as I begin to wrap up this talk, I wanted to talk about how some of these ideas came together in the work of another architect, Nicholas Negroponte. Who here is familiar with Nicholas Negroponte? More hands go up. Nicholas Negroponte founded the MIT Media Lab. And I'm going to talk about what he did before he founded the MIT Media Lab. He's an architect by training. He was born in 1942. And um, he wrote a book when, in 1970, when he was still really pretty young. He wrote a book called The Architecture Machine. And he dedicated the machine, or he dedicated the book to the first machine that can appreciate the gesture. And I use this picture. He's always got gestures in his, in his uh, talks. He always seems to have a finger up and pointing somewhere. But in that book, he wrote some things that I think still really apply today. And that's where I want to kind of end up here today, is that these ideas of artificial intelligence from its first years are still really prevalent in how we think about what our world will be like with artificial intelligence and machine learning everywhere. In his book, he wrote this statement, which is, I think, so important. And he said, it is so obvious that our interfaces, that is, our bodies, are intimately related to learning and to how we learn that one point of departure in artificial intelligence is to concentrate specifically on the interfaces. Does a machine have to possess a body like my own and be able to experience behaviors like my own in order to share what we call intelligent behavior? While it may, be, it may seem absurd, I believe that the answer is yes. Negroponte worked very closely in founding something called the Architecture Machine Group with the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab. So he ran the Architecture Machine Group from 1967 until 1984, when it became a part of the MIT Media Lab. So this is the history of the Media Lab that I'm sharing. But he worked very closely with artificial intelligence, with Marvin Minsky, who is the founder of the AI Lab, with Seymour Papert, co-founder, um, and he worked very closely with engineers and architects together in one lab to build visions of the future, to try things out. And it should be said that many of these projects were funded by the Department of Defense and by the Office of Naval Research. So they are defense-funded, DARPA-funded, military-funded projects. Um, there's a provocative project here, and you'll notice here that Minsky is playing with a robotic arm that was working on um, edge finding and stacking blocks. And in this project I'm going to show you, he was, um, the architecture machine group designed a um, system that tried to stack blocks. There were, a hun there were 400 blocks in this system, and its job was to stack them. However, there were inhabitants, and I don't know if you can see this. Do you see these cute guys here? Yeah. Gerbils! And what this says right here is gerbils match wits with computer-built environment. This is a project called Seek, and Seek was trying to stack and keep order with all of these blocks. And the gerbils were doing what gerbils do which is making a big mess. And, um, you know, it's the, the project was a part of showing these mismatches between a machine's view of the world and a living creature's view of the world. And um, I should mention that this was a part of a show um, called Software. That's what this is. This is the exhibition catalog, 1970. It's at the Jewish Museum in New York. And Ted Nelson wrote in the catalog 
that our bodies are hardware, our behavior software. And this is one of the gatefolds of the, of the document, of the catalog, Life in a Computerized Environment. And it should be said that the software show was a disaster. The machines didn't work, the projects didn't work, and Seek was also a disaster, not least because it tended to kill the gerbils. Not all projects were quite so deadly. Um, this is an image from Aspen Movie Map, um, a, 19, a project that began in about 1978 in a media room, an immersive environment where you would sit in a lounge chair and you would zoom down the streets of Aspen, Colorado. You see maps here and here. It looks like Google Street View. It also sort of looks like the Street View truck. This is how they did it. They gave a lot of thought to the chair. It's an Ames lounge chair, and it has joysticks in it. So you'd lean back and you'd zoom through space in your lounge chair. And this is from their drawings of it in their newsletter. And this is an interesting set of thoughts, except this, the reason they did this project was for military simulation. How could you do surveillance? How could you do reconnaissance in a faraway place? How could you be safe? And how could you do it in an immersive environment? And that was the purpose of the Aspen Movie Map project. Another project um, called the Data Space Proposal introduced a really interesting and kind of sinister notion of supreme usability. And what they wrote is that we are proposing to develop human computer interfaces on one hand as sophisticated in conception as a cockpit, and on the other hand as operationally simple as a TV. From either perspective, the objective is the same, supreme usability. So it's a mix of entertainment and simplicity while fitting in very easily into these computerized environments. They also worked on mapping. This is 1977, and this is a Westinghouse prototype of something that probably looks very familiar to us today. It was intended to be for mapping. You could use it potentially to do two and a half dimension mapping, as you can now on a new iPhone or an Android. They gave thought to the form factor. That one's called the Star Wars model. That one's Scandinavian chic. But they wondered about how these might be used in the field and used by various captains. So, as I close, I want to ask again where interaction design comes from. And I also want to ask where it's going. Because as we know, interaction design didn't always come from design. And one question I have, both as a practitioner and as a design professor who's educating a new generation of designers, I wonder about where we need to go next and what designers need to do. And one big thing that we all talk about is artificial intelligence and machine learning. And yet it is really difficult to figure out where we play. How can we get a foothold? What do we know? Most of us are not statisticians. Most of us do not have advanced degrees in computer science. Most of us are not trained in this way. There's this question of human-computer symbiosis that comes up more and more. My city of Pittsburgh has self-driving cars, and I see them every time I leave my house. What about data analysis and visualization? There are a lot of different ways we can approach data, but what could we do as designers? What about abstractions? We need an abstraction layer in order to have input in machine learning and in artificial intelligence. When we look at something like the processing programming language that Casey Reese and Ben Fry developed, it was a means to give designers access to programming. We don't yet have that 
for artificial intelligence, for machine learning. There's a question of models. One important thing about artificial intelligence is that it is a model of the world. And sometimes those models don't scale. One of the problems that Seek, I think, displays to us is that you can have a micro world, as they were called, something that works well in the lab or in a prototype, but when you scale it to the size of a room or a house or a city, there are problems. Consider what happened to the gerbils. We live in these spaces. We're in a space right now where our light bulbs can turn against us, as recent, um, recent stuff about, recent news about Philips has told us. We could consider what Eric, Eric Schmidt said at Davos last year, um, which is his view of the future of um, the Internet of Things. And he says, imagine you walk into a world, it, you walk into a room and the room is dynamic. And with your permission and all that, you are interacting with all the things going on in the room. A highly personalized, highly interactive, and very, very interesting world emerges. This scares the hell out of me. And what scares the hell out of me is, with your permission and all that. <laughs> Great, Eric Schmidt. <laughs> Good. Um, I think that it leaves open a lot of questions. And it really does put us as interaction designers in the world of architecture. And patterns. We turn to patterns as ways to talk about how machine learning and how artificial intelligence might play out in the world. And this is one of the things that some designers and HCI researchers at Carnegie Mellon have begun to do. Maybe this is an approach that we can take and share our learnings. Maybe we need to look backward in order to look forward. And finally, I would suggest that we need to look at ethics, that we as designers know about systems and worlds and maybe ethics are the way to look. Maybe there's something that we can bring to bear. Thank you.